In this life, there are many questions to be answered, and most people do so privately, on their own time, in their own way. Unless they run a YouTube channel where they take questions from supporters, and then you get a lightning round video like this. Wow, what an intro! As always, lightning round questions are submitted by Patreon supporters at the solar system level and above, so if you think you got a better question, get in there and prove it, man. Go for it. Do it. And if you want to see a full video on any of these topics, let me know in the comments. Let's do this. Mark Hoffman asked, wouldn't it make more sense if we used a base 12 numerical system? Sounds like somebody didn't do well in math class. It wasn't me, it was base 10. Actually, I would have loved to have used that as an excuse in math class, but I wasn't clever enough. Would it make more sense? Uh, I guess it depends on how you're using it. You know, we do kind of have a base 12 system in the way that we keep time. You know, we have 12 hour cycles of night and day. So I guess you could argue that a civilization that was more time based would, you know, maybe stick with base 12. It's actually an interesting question. You know, we, we landed on base 10, obviously, because we've got 10 fingers that we can count on. And I've always wondered, you know, if we had evolved with more or less fingers, would we have different base system of counting? Like if canines became an intelligent species, would there be a base eight system based on the number of beans? So the Mayans actually had a base 20 system, and it's thought, I don't know how true it is, but this is what I read, is that because they lived in a warm climate and they didn't have to wear shoes, they had 20 digits to work with, so they came up with a base 20 system. Again, I don't know if that's true. I read that somewhere. Sounds kind of crazy, but who knows. The Babylonians had a base 60 system. They were also the first civilization to break an hour into 60 minutes and minutes into 60 seconds. I don't think those two things are unrelated. There's also 360 degrees in a circle, which is divisible by 60, so base 60 is kind of useful for navigation. But base 60 is also kind of base 12 because 60 is divisible by 12. Now, one of the arguments that a base 12 system is more useful is that 12 is actually divisible by more numbers. For example, you can divide 12 by two, three, four, and six, but you can only divide 10 by two and five without getting into decimals and fractions. And the Egyptians are the most well-known civilization that did actually use a base 12 system. So yeah, base 12 has its uses, but if you ask me, base 10 stuck around because of the whole, you know, 10 finger thing, which made it easier for non-mathematicians, just normal people like farmers and, and craftsmen to trade with each other and, and conduct transactions and commerce. In other words, money, it's always the money. Thomas Love said, can you please in more depth explain quantum superposition? I still don't get it. Um, no. So the nature of lightning round videos is that I don't really go in depth on things. And I have covered quantum mechanics and quantum theory and other videos about as in depth as I'm capable of. I'll link those down below. But really, don't sweat it. Most people don't get quantum mechanics. Or as Richard Feynman once said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. And he was kind of paraphrasing Niels Bohr, who said anybody who's not shocked by quantum theory has not fully understood it. So, I mean, hey, if those two heavyweights struggled with it, I think it's perfectly fine for us to struggle with it. Cole Parker wrote, what new hybrid or advanced energy sources are out there? You covered micronuclear. What about tech that is solar, hot water, and photovoltaic, or hydroelectric that pumps water uphill for later release or other creative clean energy? Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be super pedantic for a second because you asked about new energy sources, and then you described pumped hydro, which is energy storage, and those are, those are two different things. I know I'm, I'm that guy now. But it does matter because there are a lot of different energy storage options and ideas out there, but energy sources, uh, there's not really anything new on the horizon unless we can make fusion happen. Like there's a lot of different ways to collect solar energy and use it and transform it, but there's still only one source of that energy and that's the sun. But you mentioned solar hot water. Uh, I wouldn't call that new by any stretch, but that's uh, one type of solar thermal energy. Interestingly, I was just reading something about this, about how, um, in the past, most solar energy was solar thermal energy. Uh, either, you know, like the concentrated solar that heats oil in a tube, then boils water, steam, turbine, that whole bit. Um, or the concentrated uh, molten salt solar thermal that focuses a bunch of mirrors on a tower and then, you know, water, steam, turbine. And it was more popular for a long time because it was cheaper, but now uh, PV panels have gone down in price so much that that's more popular and, and that's producing the majority of solar energy now. But yeah, there are systems that use solar water panels to, to heat up water. And then, you know, you can use that as hot water in your house, or you can store that hot water for later and draw energy out of it using a heat exchanger. It's not a bad option. I mean, especially if you live out in the middle of nowhere and you're off the grid, that kind of thing. But as battery storage comes down, it's becoming cheaper and easier to go that route. But yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to be a little bit of a stickler on your use of the word source in that question and just say that I'm not aware of any new energy sources outside of, you know, solar, wind, combustion, geothermal, nuclear. Uh, Again, unless I missed something, let me know. 
Joe Scott's beautiful hairline wrote, how does the pistol shrimp claw work? Does it really reach temperatures close to the sun? I mean, I don't know if I'd call it beautiful, but uh, I'll take it. But yeah, no, pistol shrimp. Pistol shrimp are really cool. Okay, so to those who might not be wise in the ways of the pistol shrimp, it's basically a type of shrimp that can snap its claw so fast that it causes a cavitation bubble in the water that creates a shock wave that stuns its prey, and then it gobbles it up. And when the vacuum of that cavitation bubble collapses, it does produce a tiny flash of light, which by itself is crazy AF because it's a very, very, very rare case of something called sonoluminescence, which is light caused by sound waves. Yes, light created by sound waves. Just sit with that for a second. But yeah, that tiny flash of light is created by a plasma that for a very, very, very small amount of time is as hot as the surface of the sun. Sounds like clickbait, it's totally true. As for how it does it, it's a combination of the type of joint in the claw and the shape of the claw. So there's two types of joints in the shrimp claws. They're both called slip joints, but the pistol shrimp has what's called a cocking slip joint. The basic gist of a cocking slip joint is that when the claw muscle is pulled, it holds open until it reaches a certain level of resistance before it gives. And that's what makes it snap shut instead of just opening and closing. And as you can see, the sort of forearm area in the claw of these shrimp is huge because the muscle that operates that claw is just crazy strong. So that's the type of joint, but then there's the shape of the claw. So yeah, inside this stationary part of the claw is an indentation, a little cavity that holds water. And then when the claw snaps shut, it forces this water out in extremely high velocity. And you might know this, but the higher a fluid's velocity, the lower its pressure. Uh, this is how airfoils work on airplane wings. It forces the air going over the top of the plane to go faster than the air below, and that higher velocity creates lower pressure above and higher pressure below. So that higher pressure lifts the wing and raises it up. Well, in the case of the pistol shrimp, that velocity is so high, it makes the pressure go down so low that it's actually lower than the vapor pressure of water. So what is the vapor point of water? Well, as you might know, water boils in a vacuum which is why if you were on a spacewalk and your helmet sprung a leak, then the last thing that you would experience before you lost consciousness would be the fluid on your eyes getting all fizzy. Fun! So yeah, the speed of the water coming out of this snap is going at such a high velocity, it lowers the pressure so much that it kind of boils the water and then creates a cavitation bubble that's filled with nothing. It's just a straight up vacuum. And when this vacuum collapses, that's when all this energy is released. Energy that creates a tiny bit of light and for a very brief moment, a temperature of about 8,000 degrees. And it creates one of the loudest sounds in nature at 218 decibels. So yeah, pistol shrimp are insane. Uh, but <laughs> I think my favorite thing about pistol shrimp is that they don't know any of that. Like they don't understand velocity and pressure and, and cavitation and, and all that. They just know that if they snap their finger, the other guy goes down. Like, like they're just walking around with a superpower. Like what are you gonna do about it, you know? Joe Scott's beautiful hairline also asked, will you make any more history topic videos in the future? Yes. Fishtail asked, with your conversations with Joe podcast, what do you look for in guests? Are they interesting people apart from their field of study? Do they need a certain amount of visibility? So um, I just released the sixth episode. So to say that we're still pretty new at the podcast thing is, is an understatement. I'm kind of just going with my gut right now. Um, the, the thing that I've been saying this whole time is it's just an excuse for me to, to meet people that I think are interesting or people that have inspired me over the years. And, and that's kind of how I'm, I'm going about it. I'm just kind of trusting that if it's somebody that I'm interested in or I think that they're interesting, that you guys will think they're interesting too. You know, I've so far interviewed um, different YouTube creators that I'm interested in. I've interviewed other science communicators and authors. Um, I, I want to get some more famous people in. I've got, I've got a couple of pretty famous people on the way. That's, that's pretty exciting, but that's not really what it's about. Like the last guy that I just interviewed, it's gonna come out in probably about a month or so. None of you have ever heard of him, but he's doing some really cool biotech stuff that I, would, I, I thought was interesting and I wanted to highlight. So no, there's no specific metric. There's no litmus test. It's just people that I think are interesting and people that I would like to meet. And, and hang out with. It's, if you've had a chance to listen to it, it's a very conversational thing. That's why I call it Conversations with Joe. And I will say just real quick, um, I, I've been considering putting the podcast on YouTube. Um, I was wanting something to kind of grow off of YouTube and do a whole just regular podcast audio thing, but um, I might have been talked into making its own channel on YouTube and just posting them up there. They might not be anything more than just audio over a logo or something like that, but 
I am curious what feedback you guys have, if you're interested in that, if you would want to, yeah, let me know in the comments if that's something you're interested in. Chase E asked, hi Joe, with the recent explosion in Tonga, is it true the blast was larger than the largest bomb tested? What was the scale and extent of the blast? Could it have possible positive changes in our climate or was it just not large enough? Actually, it's pronounced Hunga Tonga, which is maybe the most fun to pronounce name I've ever come across in my life, so I'm never gonna stop saying it. Actually, it's Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha'apai. Right. Hunga Tonga. Right, but, but there's an extra little... <laughs> Anyway, to answer your question, NASA said the Hunga Tonga equal between 4 and 18 megatons, which would make it, quote, hundreds of times stronger than the bomb that dropped on Hiroshima. But Hiroshima, despite how many deaths it caused, was actually a very small atomic bomb, especially compared to some of the ones that were tested later on, which I believe is what you're asking about when you mentioned the largest bomb ever made. So if you were asking about the largest bomb ever made, you were talking about the Tsar Bomba. By the way, the only thing more fun than saying Hunga Tonga is saying Tsar Bomba versus Hunga Tonga. The Tsar Bomba, by the way, was ridiculous. It was insane. Uh, it created a shockwave that circled the world three times, and it shattered windows 480 miles away. It, it's just so much bigger than most people realize. That would be like a bomb going off in New York City and breaking windows in Raleigh, North Carolina. Or a bomb in Chicago breaking windows in Nashville. Or one in LA breaking windows in Tucson. Or one in Houston breaking windows in Oklahoma City. So yeah, the Tsar Bomba was estimated to be between 50 and 58 megatons, so yeah, much bigger than Hunga Tonga. If you're going by megatons, there is another one that makes the whole question more complicated, and that's the strength of its shockwave. Okay, so in 1996, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was signed, and part of that treaty was it set up an organization to monitor nuclear weapons tests around the world. And the organization that was created by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was cleverly named the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Anyway, these guys operate a global array of stations that measure atmospheric pressure around the world, and according to them, Hunga Tonga was actually quite stronger than the Tsar Bomba. So when Tsar Bomba went off, it measured 0.5 to 0.7 hectopascals at their station in New Zealand, about 10,000 miles away. But Hunga Tonga measured around two hectopascals in Austria, which is roughly the same distance. So by that metric, that would make Hunga Tonga nearly four times stronger than Tsar Bomba. Now, I don't know, maybe those are two completely different measurements, megatons versus hectopascals, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess it depends on how you measure it. But your question about whether it would affect the climate, that has absolutely nothing to do with how strong a blast it was. That has to do with what got blasted out. And Hunga Tonga definitely put a lot of ejecta very high into the atmosphere. In fact, Oxford University Research Fellow Simon Proud said on Twitter, quote, Based on analysis of data from global weather satellites, our preliminary data for the Tonga volcanic clouds suggests that it reached an altitude of 39 kilometers or 24 miles. We'll refine the accuracy of that in the coming days, but if correct, that's the highest cloud we've ever seen. But scientists don't think that it was strong enough to lower the global temperature. Because Hunga Tonga released a lot of ash, but not a lot of sulfur dioxide. And it turns out that's what actually produces most of the cooling effect. For example, Mount Pinatubo in 1991, that was the last volcano to actually affect global temperature, and it was way heavier on the sulfur dioxide. Hunga Tonga released about 400,000 tons of sulfur dioxide. That's only 2% of what came out of Pinatubo. And Pinatubo's effect only lasted for a couple of days anyway. So yeah, maybe bigger than Tsar Bomba, depending on how you measure it, but not big enough to cool off the globe. Chasey also asked, with SpaceX's Starlink, those satellites surely will deorbit within a few years due to atmospheric drag. But is there any risk if they happen to have any collisions while still in orbit that debris can hang on around, causing a feared Kessler syndrome? I feel like I just talked about that. Now, this is clearly a response to my recent video on satellite internet, and this is actually something I was gonna put in that video, but I was running long and it just didn't quite make it in. But yeah, Kessler syndrome, I, I, I'm very worried about that. I mean, when I see these governments testing anti-satellite missiles and creating debris fields, it, it infuriates me. It's just, it's so irresponsible. But, I mean, somebody could make the argument that SpaceX is being just as irresponsible putting tens of thousands of satellites in orbit for Starlink. I mean, when it comes down to it, really, what's the difference between 40,000 pieces of debris from a collision and 40,000 satellites? And that's a fair question. Um, here's how I look at that. There are 19,500 incorporated cities in the United States. So imagine if each city only had one car. What's the chance that any one of them would hit any other car? Pretty low, right? These cars are all tens, maybe hundreds of miles away from each other. So now spread that around the entire planet. The US only makes up 1.87% of the Earth's surface, which sounds impossible, but that's actually true. So at this point, these cars are all thousands of miles away from each other. 
the chance of them hitting each other now is exceedingly low. And then keep in mind that satellites don't all orbit on the same plane. You've got a third dimension to play with now, and there are hundreds of orbital levels going up thousands of miles. The point is there's a lot more room up there than our brains probably think. And um, to put that 19,500 number in perspective, that's four times more than the number of active satellites in orbit right now. Uh, a bit less than the number of orbital debris that we're aware of and tracking right now. And yeah, about half of what Starlink is eventually planning to, to be, about 40,000. So I think, you know, as long as these are kept in a very low Earth orbit that will decay pretty quickly and they're all kind of managed by the same company that can keep track of them in the same system, I mean, it's, it's about as safe as you can hope for. Brian Beswick asked, how scary is the title of this article? Cosmic spider found to be a source of powerful gamma rays. Cosmic spider? <laughs> This is just proof that the universe is produced by John Peters. If you don't get the reference, Kevin Smith tells this amazing story about working on a Superman script with a producer named John Peters who is obsessed with giant spiders. All right, so let's see about these giant spiders. A bright, mysterious source of gamma rays has been found to be a rapidly spinning neutron star, dubbed a millisecond pulsar, that is orbiting a star in the process of evolving into an extremely low-mass white dwarf. These types of binary systems are referred to by astronomers as spiders because the pulsar tends to eat the outer parts of the companion star as it turns into a white dwarf. Yeah, that, that's some pretty serious clickbait. One of the most significant bummers of my lifetime. Brian also asked, with what seems to be an exponentially growing mountain of scientific discoveries, what things from science fiction do you think might become science fact within our lifetime? Okay, I, I swear I'm not just trying to promote the podcast here, but I do have a video, an episode on the way, an interview where I talk to a sci-fi writer, and we, we talk about that very thing. So, yeah, wait for that. And when you do listen to that interview, may I suggest you do it with today's sponsor, Raycon Earbuds. I'll be expecting the Segway of the Year trophy in the mail any minute now. So last September I took a trip to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and while I was taking a walk one day, I snapped this picture and I uploaded it to Instagram. And more than one commenter pointed out that I was wearing the very Raycon earbuds that I talk about in my videos. And I'm like, yeah, I, I actually use them. <laughs> what, do you think I'm just gonna shill for something like some kind of sellout and lose my Gen X card? I don't think so. But no, look, I got these everyday earbuds a couple years ago and I've had no reason to replace them. No, they fit into this compact little charger. They're easy to carry around. You plug the whole thing in right there to charge it and you only have to do that once every couple of weeks maybe. They connect effortlessly with my phone. I've never had a problem with it connecting. I wish other devices worked as well. But most of all, they're comfortable. Like, that's always been a problem with me in earbuds. They start to hurt my ears after a while. These never have. And, and they don't fall out. And look, I could read a big long list of celebrities and endorse these like Snoop Dogg, Melissa Etheridge, Brandy, Ray J, who was a co-founder. I could read those names, but I won't. All that really matters is that I can vouch for them, but if you don't want to take my word for it, they've got like 48,000 five-star reviews. So if you'd rather listen to total strangers on the internet, fine. The fact is they're just, they're just great earbuds for a fraction of the price of a lot of the others out there. So if your earbuds just crapped out on you or you lost them, basically, whatever, if you're in the market for some new ones, here, give them a try. You can get 15% off if you go to buyraycon.com slash Joe Scott. You'll get a discount on a great pair of earbuds and it helps support the channel. So again, it's buyraycon.com slash Joe Scott. Link's in the description. Big thanks to Raycon for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are forming an awesome community, supporting this channel, doing cool things together, and just being generally awesome people. Uh, I got some new names I gave to murder real quick. We got Michelle Wallace, Bruno Cavalcante, uh, Samael, James Hill, JC137, uh, Greg Branch, Charles White, Richard Seymour, Michael J. Smith, uh, Stephen K. Knapp, Rowan S., Sobano S., William Frank, Marnie Irwin, Robert, Lily Pragold, Jim Spaulding, Joshua Wood, or, yeah, Joshua Wood, <laughs> Ryan S., Kinsgrove, and Fusion Illusion. I've got a whole lot more to get to. I'm way behind on these things, but thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos and exclusive live streams and just, you know, form an awesome, be part of an awesome community and all that kind of stuff, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like this one, so you might want to check that one out. There's all these others over here that have my little face on them and the little thumbnails. And if you like them and you want to see more, I do invite you to subscribe. I'll come back with videos every Monday. And as I said at the beginning of this video, if any of these topics look interesting to you, just let me know. They could become a full video of their own. All right, gang, that's it for now. Thanks again to the people who ask questions in Patreon. Thank you guys for watching. Now go out there, have an eye-opening week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday.
Love you guys. Take care.